Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, could I ask a favor of folks up front? When I have like 10 minutes left, just give, I don't have any clocks up here, so I have no idea. Like, I, that, that was my next point. I am the only thing standing between you and barbecue, so uh, they have been told that none will be served until my last slide appears, so you're in it for the long haul. All right, and also, before I get started, thank you, Doug, for 10 great years of conferences, and thank you to the Security Onion team for all the work that you all put in. It's their hard work that makes every single one of us better at our jobs, so thank you all very, very much. Really appreciate it. All right, so a little bit about me. My, uh, my clicker doesn't work, that's good. All right, so a um, little bit about me. Right now, I am Principal Technical Success Manager for a product known as a 40 NDR Cloud. It's a network detection and response tool. Uses a lot of the same underlying technologies as, uh, as Security Onion does. Um, I've been a Security Onion user since uh, about 2014, almost 10 years now. And for roughly that, uh, that, that time span, I've worked at several different um, security vendors. Um, Phil mentioned that uh, we worked together at Mandy and FireEye. I've also worked at Gigamon and uh, now at Fortinet. And during that entire time span, it's been strictly in the network detection and response, network security monitoring, and network forensics uh, areas. So I've you know, worked with tons of customers, seen a lot of, seen a lot of stuff. So, what am I here talking about today? Well, I was getting ready to have to have a conversation with a customer. Um, in my current role, it's my job to work with folks that are defending networks to help them understand how to use the product that I support. And more importantly, uh, help them understand the data that they're seeing and you know, how, to, how to use that data. Uh, you know, some of the other things that we do are we, you know, we help skill up uh, our customers, uh, you know, take them uh, across the maturity model, uh, move them from being proactive to, or from reactive to proactive. So we, it, we, we build a lot of trust with our customers. And I was about to have a difficult conversation with this customer because they had made the decision to limit the traffic that they were sending to their network sensors. And they were only, they had made the decision to only send outbound traffic uh, to the sensors. And the, their reasoning was that they wanted to cut down the amount of bandwidth, bandwidth that was being observed, so the amount of traffic. But uh, you know, they, they approached me at, uh, you know, on their decision and said, well, you know, we're, we're still seeing uh, flow records. You know, we're, we're still seeing the connections happen. We're still seeing uh, you know, DNS lookups, uh, and we're, we're seeing what users are looking up, you know, what's the big deal? So, one thing you have to know about me is like 73% of my brain worker threads are devoted to coming up with analogies. Another 10% is making up fake stats, the rest are just like hung process. So, you know, I have to make an analogy for this. And the one that I came up with um, I, I don't know if, if you all have seen it. There, there was a 1981 art film about a college professor who traveled the globe punching Nazis. Um, and, and there's a couple of other like storylines in there. Um, you know, there was a love interest. Uh, there's a little bit of a romance. It, it, there's also like some, some buddy comedy type stuff. But at the heart of it, you know, he's traveled around the world punching Nazis. And the, the subplot that the, the later half of the movie focuses on is he has to find a, a, a certain object. A, you know, it's a, a very big, important treasure that he has to find. But in order to find that treasure, you know, you have to throw an obstacle in the way. He has to find another, uh, another artifact. So what he has to find is what is called the headpiece to the Staff of Ra. It's a gold circular disc uh, has, a, has a bird on it and a gym, some writing on it, 
and you're supposed to be able to, to use this to locate the, the big treasure. Right now, his ex-girlfriend in Tibet is in possession of this, so he, he travels to Tibet to, uh, to meet her and talk to her about you know, getting this so he can find the big treasure. Well, I mentioned Nazis before, they're after this too. They show up, big fight happens, accidental arson takes place, and in the course of retrieving this, uh, this headpiece of the Staff of Ra, the, 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 the chief bad guy burns his hand so severely uh, that he imprints the, the medallion on his hand. So I mentioned earlier that the, the medallion had writing on it. Well, that writing is kind of important because in order to use it, you need to know how tall the staff is that, the, uh, that the, uh, this headpiece will fit on in order to locate the big treasure. So, meanwhile in Egypt, the Nazis start digging for the, the big treasure because they've got the, they've got the headpiece. They know how tall the staff needs to be, so they start digging. About this time, our hero meets up with his buddy in Egypt. They find a local imam to uh, take a look at the, uh, the headpiece and translate it for them so they can find the length. So in the course of the translation, he's, he's translating one side and he says it must be six kadam high. And they're like, oh great, we know it. But then he flips it over and he says, ah, but you have to take one kadam away. And you, you can kind of see the gears turning in, in his head. He, 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 thinks, he thinks something good might be happening. That's when they know that the Nazis were using incomplete information to, to locate this, this big treasure. So I kind of think that was an apt analogy. I'm, I'm trying to explain to this customer that if you're only saying one half of your traffic, you have a picture, but it's not a complete picture. You, you have an idea, but, it, but it's not a complete idea. So what are the causes of one-sided traffic aside from an intentional move? Well, there's packet loss. Uh, I mean, by definition, one-sided traffic is missing packets. Uh, so, you know, packet loss could be one. An entire seminar could be done, uh, actually probably an entire course can be done on the causes and remediation of, of packet loss. Asymmetric routing can be another reason why you're only seeing you know, one part of the traffic. You used to see it a lot in MPLS networks. I don't run into MPLS as much as I used to, but you still see asymmetric routing in place. So traffic is leaving via one ISP and it's returning via another. So that's one way you can get one half of uh, a conversation. Misconfiguration, this is a big one. So uh, there, there's lots of different ways that, uh, that things can be misconfigured. So packet loss, it's an imperfect world. Packets drop out all the time. That's gonna be intermittent type stuff. Um, you know, what, what I'm focusing on is the all or nothing. When you're looking at the traffic, you can only see one side of the, the, the uh, uh, of the conversation. And one thing to note here, loss is not drops. Packet loss is different than packet drops. Packet loss happens outside the sensor for a variety of reasons. Drops are things that couldn't be handled by the protocol analyzer uh, because it was too busy, so it couldn't get to it. And that's the difference between loss and drops. So packet loss can sometimes be attributed to your internal network's uh, switch. It could be overloaded. Uh, a switch's primary job is switching packets, not mirroring packets. So if you're using a span port, you know, it has to make a decision about where it spins its CPU cycles. So that's, that's one way that you could have, uh, you know, loss could contribute to uh, one-sided traffic. Or it could just be that you are trying to fit 10 gig of data in a five gig pipe. Uh, you know, you just, just not everything's gonna make it. So I mentioned before, uh, MPLS networks, uh, you know, commonly where, you know, I've run into this in the past. Uh, asymmetric routing exists in other places in organizations. Uh, so I'm, I'm betting if you ha are defending a network 
of any size, you may have run into one of these scenarios that uh, is causing you to see only one side of the traffic. Uh, the, when you're dealing with routing related um, issues, typically it's gonna be systemic, it's gonna be all or nothing. So when you're looking at all the traffic coming from a particular sensor watching uh, you know, a, a, a network tap, uh, if it's a routing issue, you're only gonna be seeing you know, one, uh, one side of the conversation. Configuration is uh, probably the, the most prominent reason I run into it. Um, I've dealt with I, several hundreds of customers, very large networks. We run into this invariably. I don't think I've had a single customer where we didn't experience this at some point in their environment. But most of the time is configuration related. So configuration can be uh, some of your more uh, advanced active taps, basically the more bells and whistles and knobs that you can turn on a device, the higher the chance that somebody is going to misconfigure something. It could be a, uh, a tap where you have the send and receive, the TX and the RX lines. Maybe you have a cable that wasn't plugged in. Maybe it's the wrong cable. Um, you know, there, there's a couple reasons there where it would cut off one half of the traffic. But really, the, the switch mirror ports and, and you know, port spanning is the primary uh, reason that we, we run into one-sided traffic. Load balancers also uh, are coming up in my rankings of reasons why I have to have this conversation with people. Um, and it uh, usually has to do with uh, the hashing on load balancing. Uh, so if, if you do not have your load balancing on a packet broker set up correctly, uh, you could be sending incorrect traffic to, uh, to sensors. All right, I mentioned before that span ports are 79.3% of the time the problem. Um, and one of the ways that you can tell if the switch is the problem that um, where you're seeing all one side of the conversation is look to see if it's sporadic loss that you're uh, uh, getting from that switch. Is it only part of the time that you're seeing one side of the conversation? If so, that could just be the switch is overloaded. You know, uh, look at getting a, a tap. Um, also, I mentioned before about 10 gig of data in a five gig pipe. Uh, whenever you're mirroring, you know, you can't put uh, a one gigabit per second fully saturated line uh, and expect a one gigabit per second uh, receive on your, uh, on your monitor port to be able to handle that traffic. So uh, again, make sure that you're not trying to mirror more traffic than you can actually deal with. And the number one reason that we have issues with one-sided traffic is the simple configuration of uh, setting a port switch to bidirectional. It's either TX, RX, or bidirectional. The thing to understand is when you make the request to have your sensor connected to the network, uh, to a span port, you're probably not the one doing it. You're probably not the one configuring the switch. There may have been another tool there before you that didn't require bidirectional. And if your order just says connected to the span port, that's what you're gonna get and you may not be seeing everything. And unless you go in and verify after you connect, uh, it, it could be months before you notice that you're just not seeing uh, everything that you're supposed to be seeing. All right, so what does one-sided traffic look like if we are looking at the data itself? And this was the fun part of the conversation to have with the customers actually showing them in their data. This is what you expect to see, this is what you actually see. So, I, for this example, I just did a simple wget to a website to download a Windows binary. So here's what that would look like. Full duplex, it's an eye chart, I apologize. But the relevant data you've all seen before. This is the request, this is the response, this is the status code, this is the TTL. Uh, you know, you've got all the data that you need to work with for uh, DNS traffic. All right. Now let's look at it where I'm only capturing the transmit side of the client port. So I'm gonna use TX and RX 
here. TX and RX depends on your point of view and where you're capturing. So I might as well just be saying side A and side B. So this uh, TX from the client port, we're missing some things, right? We're missing the, uh, the, the, the query class and we're missing the query type, uh, class and the type. So, uh, okay, so what's the big deal? I mean, we have the request, we got the response, you know, that's, you know, nine times out of 10, that's enough data for what we need uh, to be able to do. Let's look at the other side. Well, this time, we don't get a response code back, but we know, uh, you know, the query type that was asked. We don't get the TTLs back, and we also don't get the answer back. So uh, uh, we, we don't know what was returned on the, uh, 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 from the server. All right, but, uh, you know, for the most part, we have at least what the user was looking up. So let's look at um, connection records. Full duplex connection records, the, the key here, and we'll talk about it uh, you know, in a little bit more detail here. We, we've got the full complement of data. We've got the number of bytes, we've got the number of packets, uh, and we also have the connection history and the connection state. Connection history is gonna be telling for us. Uh, it, it's really going to help us in the future uh, understand whether or not we're seeing good data or not. So let's look at a connection record from where we're capturing transmit only from the client workstation. So you'll notice we, we have values here, but we have zeros. We've got a connection history. We see that it begins with a caret, or what's the other word that you can use for it? Is it? like circumflex or something, it's got another name. Anyway, we got a caret here at the beginning and we have all lowercase afterwards. I don't know if you all have in your, uh, you know, your Zeke classes, your security young classes gone over what the connection history is for, but you'll, you may remember that uppercase means that is a packet observed from the origin and the, and a, and a capital is gonna be a packet observed from the responder. Uh, the caret at the beginning just says that Zeke had to flip uh, what it thought was uh, origin and responder based on the traffic that it observed. So you can think of it as also meaning it didn't see a sin in a TCP connection. And one thing to note also is we don't, uh, the protocol analyzer was unable to determine uh, or it was able, uh, unable to decide that it was HTTP, so we don't have anything at all for network protocol. Now let's look at the other side of that traffic. Well, now we have client bytes, but you'll see we have sad F for our, uh, our connection history. Uh, again, all capitals, so we're only seeing the client uh, communicate, uh, but we don't see any server bytes coming back. But interestingly, it, it, it understands that we uh, it, that it was HTTP uh, as the protocol. All right, HTTP itself. We know what we get in an HTTP record. We get the user agent, we get the URI, we get the response code uh, and the method. All the good stuff, and including the MIME type that the uh, that the server sent back. So all great data. TX only. Different story. We don't get. Uh, uh, we don't get anything from the, the, what the client wanted to do. Basically, all we're getting back is a response MIME type from the server and the server status code. And you'll notice that we also get a, a, a body length back, but it's not the same number we got when we were looking at full duplex. So it's an incorrect number. It's still there, it's still generated. If we have uh, any type of analytics running that's basing anything off of this, it's not going to, uh, it's not gonna give you uh, accurate information. Uh, from the other side, the RX side, we don't know what the server sent back. We don't get a status code, so we don't know if, it's, if it was successful, but we do know that the user agent that the user used, we know the URI and uh, the host that it went to, but we don't know whether it's successful. All right, Fi uh, the, the file information, full complement of analyzers there. The, the things that we're looking for out of this, we've got the MIME type, 
uh, and the hashes. So, you know, the, the, to me, that's, uh, and, and, and the, the, the byte count. Looking at TX only, we have all that data, but it's not really what happened because we're only ca capturing one half of that. So we still have byte seen, and it's an incorrect value. We also have hashes, but they're not the hashes of plink.exe. Uh, so again, you're operating off of incorrect information. And when we look at the other side, we don't have anything at all. There wasn't even a file record generated. All right. As we know, Zeek, when it sees a uh, Windows binary, is going to generate a portable executable record for it. So we've got a PE full duplex, full complement of data. We know when it was compiled, all that good stuff. TX only, no dice. No PE record generated because there was no file record generated. Suricata, oh, this is, I, I think, the only Suricata slide that I have. Uh, but if in, this, uh, in this instance, a full duplex, we have a, a, a Suricata event trigger. Uh, so we've got good information there. Once we start looking at uh, not having both sides of the conversation, for this particular signature, you know, we're not going to get anything at all. All right, I'll briefly talk about it. So that was a north-south example, um, which, you know, that, I, I think that this customer that I was dealing with was more interested in north-south because they were wanting to know what domains users were, uh, were going to. That's why they were excited to still get the reduction in bandwidth, but also still see the domain. Uh, this is where, um, you know, it, it, it opened their eyes, looking at east-west traffic. So east-west is where we were typically going to see SMB. And here's an example of a, um, uh, you know, just a file transfer. TX only. Again, this time, we don't, uh, we don't get anything from the client, but let's make note of the OTH for connection state. And if we go and look that up, we'll know that uh, that means that we caught data midstream. Uh, like we, we didn't see the beginning of the conversation, but we got data. Um, oh, I apologize. I should have been back on, on that one. So, yeah, so we have OTH on that one. We have uh, a connection history showing both sides of the, the communication. But when we look at TX only, we also see OTH. So we still have the same connection state. So you can't always go off of connection state to know if you've got one-sided traffic or not. And again, we're not seeing the protocol. Uh, it didn't know that it was SMB. Now, on RX only, on the client side, we, again, it's OTH, don't see anything from the server. So incomplete information. From a file standpoint, SMB is still going to produce a file record. We get all that great data. On the TX side, nothing. Not, not, no file uh, record generated. Rx side, no file generated for that one either. So right there, uh, by only seeing one side of the conversation in a SMB file transfer, we don't have any of the, the file records. We have the flow records, but, but that was it. Uh, SMB files, again, all the, the great metadata about SMB, uh, the actions, the, the file names, and uh, all of the uh, SMB timestamps. TX only, no go on that one. And RX only, also no go on that. All right, so if we look at our environment, how do we know that this is a problem? So Zeek provides a number of ways to tell us. First, check your informational events. Uh, the weird log is there for a reason. Uh, you know, I'm sure you all have covered this in, in classes before, but uh, the weird log is for any network-related uh, things that don't adhere to network standards. You can usually find references to them in the weird logs. Um, and outside of just looking for one-sided traffic, it's also a great place to look for uh, your uh, just sporadic loss on your network. So. When you're looking at a weird log, there are three event types to pay special attention to. 
data before established. That's a good indicator. Possible split routing, that's, I mean, it says it right there, uh, what your problem is. That, that's a no-brainer to fix, or not fix, that's a no-brainer to, to spot. And uh, the final one is inappropriate fin. So it just didn't see a session close in, in a proper manner. Uh, and you, you'll see this, uh, you know, with, with prevalence uh, if it is an issue on your network. So the other way besides looking at the weird log is actually just go looking for it. So look at your connection states. When you are doing searches, stack on the connection state and also the connection history. Um, and when you, if, if you have a large sensor fleet, uh, you know, it, focus on one sensor at a time to try to, to isolate where the problem is. So when you're in, um, uh, in Security Onion, on, in the Security Onion console, you can go to the dashboard. And we'll talk about this query uh, in, in the next slide here. I'll break it down. But basically, uh, it, it, I, I start with two, two different queries. One looking for north-south traffic uh, that is uh, one-sided and uh, a second one that's looking at east-west. So this first one here is looking at RFC 1918 source to non-RFC 1918 external. If you've got other networks that you've put into your home net into Zeke or Suricata, obviously put those in there as well. But then we start stacking on uh, all of those things that I mentioned on the previous slide. So uh, we stack on the, the name of the sensor, we stack on the connection state, and, as well as the, uh, uh, the transport and uh, the transport and connection state name and then connection history and connection state. Anyway, you, you can use the tools at your disposal to, to locate this stuff and it stands out pretty readily. So again, the construction of the query is just focus on your uh, connection, just your, your network flows. Look for uh, internal with an RFC 1918 and a destination of not RFC 1918. And then you do the inverse of that, you know, a source of not RFC 1918 and a destination of RFC 1918. Then you stack it on the observer name. Uh, so it's going to be the name of your sensor. That way, when you get the dashboard up, you can just click on that one, isolate it, and then start looking at, at the data. Then I stack on uh, transport and connection state description, just for flavor. And then, because it, you can do a pie chart, do a pie chart, whatever. Uh, so uh, the final one is on connection state and connection history. A again, all lowercase, you're seeing one side of the conversation. All uppercase, you're seeing one side of the conversation. For the east-west, just a, much simpler. This time you're looking for a source in RFC 1918 and a destination in uh, RFC 1918. Then you group that by the same things, the observer name, the transport, the state description, and then the connection state and the connection history. All right. So we found it, what do we do about it? Well, you fix it. That's not easy most of the time, unless you have great people skills, and like Dave was saying, buy pizza and beer for the network team. But it, it's gonna involve dealing with other groups, uh, unless you are the, the one person shop that is in charge of everything with a power cord. Um, you're gonna have to deal with change windows sometimes. Sometimes those are very long. It might be next quarter we might be able to get to it. Um, so it, some, just saying, yeah, just go out there and fix your problems. It, you know, just throw a tap in there. It, it's sometimes harder uh, than it sounds. So anyway, fix your configurations. Uh, if you determine there's a span port, just you know, uh, either get a tap to replace it or you know, figure out whether or not your switch is overloaded or you have the settings correct. And if you're dealing with asymmetric routing, look at moving your sensor to a different location. We are capturing the aggregated uh, traffic. And if you can't fix it, it may be a span port in a remote office in you know, the, the, the opposite end of the globe where you have no staff available to work on anything. Sometimes you have to live with it. But as GI Joe says, knowing is half the battle. If you understand that from that network segment and that closet on the other side of the globe, I'm only gonna be able to see one half of the traffic, at least you understand that. 
So use other tools at your disposal, your EDR, install Elastic Agent with Security Onion, you know, start, start getting in more data to help cover the gaps. Uh, you know, just understand what data is available to you. And at, at the end of it, you just have to persevere. Like, we have to deal with what we have available to us, M make the best of what we have, always be checking the health of not only your sensors, but also the data that the sensors are consuming. Uh, make that part of your routine to, you know, every quarter, just go in and make sure that we're seeing good traffic from all of our capture points. Because as networks grow, uh, you know, it's really easy to, uh, you know, lose control of, you know, the, the good data that you, that you used to have just over, uh, you know, a, a couple of months of expansion. So it, at the end of the day, just be aware of the data that you have in your network. Understand that, you know, one side of traffic can cause problems in visibility. You're still gonna get some data, but just understand what data may be incorrect and uh, you know, do what you can to, to work around it. And I also wanna say, I forgot to, to hold it up before, but right before I came out here, my good friend and boss, George Sanford, gave me the headpiece of the staff of RAW and I completely forgot to hold it up before, but thank you, George, for, for that. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you all for the time. Really appreciate it. You can now go have barbecue.